Good evening. I'm so glad you're back, and I'm glad to be back. Thank you for stopping by the shop. It's been a nice little break for me, actually. I was, I was honestly, I was kind of feeling burnt out. <laughs> All that uh, whirlwind of getting things done, and I think the last time, was this the last class? We did the... Uh, Maybe not. The coasters was oh, yeah, the last the coasters, class. Yeah. Yep. But we finished up this shop stool and I got another I got another coat on it and rubbed it out. It's kind of nice right now. I may leave it like that, but I just tried it out a little bit. Um, but I won't wear it out. Don't worry. <laughs> it looks great. Yeah, I love it. I I love it. I mean, I think it's really really nice. The cool thing about it is you can go a lot of different ways with it. Now, I just realized I forgot to get ready something that I wanted to show you, and that is that we have the finished drawings of the shop stool. What, what was I thinking? Um, I but, think they've seen them enough at this point. They're ready to have them. <laughs> but the final drawing was so nice. It was all laid out beautifully. I'll show them again. They just arrived today, so um, I was mentioning on the... Uh, chat that the first batch went out this afternoon and the rest will go out tomorrow. So thank you for your patience. That's coming. Yes, we, uh, I enjoyed doing that and I, I put in all the, all the uh, shapes that went into my own and detailed it with as much information as you could possibly need. That in conjunction with the video series uh, and then your own imagination, you're going to be all set. So anyway, Thank you for stopping by tonight. Um, if you like these videos, please subscribe and like and share. I gotta say that. But really, why, why haven't you subscribed yet? Just mash the button. <laughs> That's the old song. The old North Carolina phrase. And maybe we should tell them what that means. You're not gonna uh, get mash? inundated with emails, no subscribing. Like it's, oh. it's to be aware and notified of when we do release video or we're going live, that kind of thing. Yeah, and when you subscribe to uh, someone, it helps our, what does it help? Our viewership, the uh, algorithm or whatever. Yeah. And plus just us having more viewers helps us potentially one day monetize without having to, you know, do it other ways. But we're loving it. We thank you all so much for your engagement with the, uh, drawings with uh, um, the donations some of you have made and a special shout out today to the Guild of New Hampshire Woodworkers for a wonderful uh, gift to uh, what we've been doing for the past months really um, actually a year but when you go back on the shop night live so thank you to the Guild of New Hampshire Woodworkers yes. I was talking with the president today if you're in New Hampshire and you don't belong to that guild you're missing out because it's, it's $40 a year um, or 75 for two years. And the amount of information and the fellowship you have with other members is just outstanding. There's, it's top notch. There's like six or seven subgroups. If you want to get into guitar making or 18th century furniture building, I forget what other ones. <laughs> it's like uh, antiques, like restoring furniture. I think that's one. But... Uh, one boat building. Can you imagine? I would love to do that myself. But um, anyway, you can, even if you're not in the state, you can actually join that group and have access to videos and um, the journal. It's a great magazine they put out. So anyway, 600 strong. There are just over 600 members. So it's a fantastic group. But you can look yes. them up. How, what's their? G N. H.W. Guild of New Hampshire Woodworkers. Dot org? G-N-H-W dot. I'm not sure if it's a comma dot org, but you can just Google Guild of New Hampshire Woodworkers. Yeah, and, and you'll come up with their website. It's cool. It's a cool site. All right, so thank you all for everything you're doing. This is really fun for us, and we feel like we're just beginning, and we love the growth and the chatter that you're all doing. Uh, you might notice my shirt. I'm breaking out the short sleeve because it's kind of hot. And I didn't turn on any AC in the shop. And this is our logo. We're not going to have shirts 
for a little while <laughs> anyway Yet. we can't hassle with all the different sizes we just can't <laughs> so we're mugs we're going to have hats coming out soon and we will soon have glue buckets okay <laughs> <laughs> they're coming one size fits all all right <laughs> so that's what you get anyway tonight what i want to do is a little kind of uh pre-brief of what's going to begin tuesday night we're on. Keep going. Okay. So I'm not sure where I lost you. Do you know where I lost? I think, I don't know. Start from okay. where you're starting for the new project. Um, yes. So our new project is going to begin this coming Tuesday night. It's going to be the Craftsman Style Coffee Table. And I'm going to talk a little bit in a minute about what Craftsman Style is. But, um, that's going to start Tuesday night. And instead of going just Tuesday and, and Saturday, we're going to do, a, we're melding it together until we're done with this course with our Shop Night Live. So we're going to have three times a week, we're going we're gonna to go through this um, Craftsman Style coffee table. And we have a, because we have a class, our first in-shop class in a long time is coming up on June, June 15th. 15th, so two weeks from Monday. So I'd like to be done this Craftsman Style coffee table. So it's going to kind of be a fast road, but it'll be a lot of fun, and we'll be able to meet more regularly and get that done. So, yeah, and do mention that we do have spots in our classes. We're, we're running with them this summer. There is one more spot uh, left in the veneering class, June 15th to the 19th, if that interests you. And we just added a second veneering class in September. Plus, um, September 15th. 14th. 14th. 18th. Yeah, so get in early. I think we have three on the way, three that might join immediately. So yep. there's only eight, so it's really fun. And then and a chair making class, an experienced woodworking class, wood turning class. Yes. So good things going on. Check that out at, at in shop classes at our website. Yes. All right, so let's get started. I'm thinking about it. I just decided, actually, I finally decided this is what we should do while I'm developing this next project. Um, this coffee table, this craftsman style coffee table, I'd, I've not, I don't, not built one. I've not made a craftsman style coffee table. So I thought this would be a fun time to um, get that done. I have made a craftsman style ottoman, which I'm going to draw from to uh, build this. But the craftsman style, or the arts and crafts also called the Arts and Crafts Period of Furniture Making. Um, this is a book that I've referred to some in, in reading about this today. I'm no expert on this, but I've read enough that I get the gist. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, a lot of these furniture style movements are actually rooted in what was going on socially in the world. So it's kind of interesting to see how art depicts reality and life. Much like the music world, you know, we have jazz, blues, rock and roll. You know, you have these different periods and shifts in music that goes along with society in general. So same thing in the furniture world, the type of art in, in uh, design that was going on in the furniture world. So the big intrusion to furniture design was the Industrial Revolution, which happened in the mid-1800s, you know, beginning early and then really breaking out strong in the mid-1800s, um, where prior to the Industrial Revolution, all furniture was pretty much made by hand. There were some basic machines used, but um, you had much more considered craftsmanship imbued into each piece. So the 18th century furniture uh, period, which I was all in, that was where I learned, the Chippendale, Queen Anne, federal furniture, all of that that happened in the mid-1700s, right up through the beginning of the 1800s, the early 1800s, that was con considered the golden age of furniture making, because there was so much personal expression and handwork, and everything was done 
you know, s more slowly with, by hand to the most, for the most part. Then the Industrial Revolution hits and you start to have more mechanization and the introduction to almost assembly line procedures to build things. So it especially got into the, um, um, what are we thinking, uh, the arts, not the arts and crafts, the empire style, but um, Victorian. Victorian style was extremely lavish, gaudy, elaborate. You've seen it. It's a lot of curves and carved um, leaves and, and grapes and the amazing work. I, I'm blown away when I see beautiful Victorian furniture. But, but a lot of it was production made later on and it started you know, being doweled together and haphazardly put together. And, and there became like this, there was this reaction against the big factories. And it be, this whole movement really started overseas in England. And, um, and this whole dehumanization of people and that they were more separated from, from the personal influence and making of things, you know? So there was actually an art critic in, who was also a professor of art history at Oxford University in the mid-1800s, 1850, um, on through, I think, the late 1880, something like that, John Ruskin. And he was a pretty well-known um, art critic and historian in that period. And he, uh, he wrote some significant books, but he, he wrote frequently about how bad this was for, uh, for the culture, the world, that, that people were now being kind of more turning into cogs and just part of a machine instead of the personal expression in making things. And one of his things he said that became one of the tenets of the arts and crafts movement was that work, let me make sure I say it correctly, work was meant to be joyous. I love that because if you haven't noticed, that's what I feel I'm all about in doing this, all right? I want you to feel joy, because I'm feeling joy. I'm not trying to teach you anything. I'm just saying this is what it is. This is what it is for me, all right? And I, I love doing this, all right? And I, I love the personal expression and the chance to take an original piece of material and, and create and design and form it into something. And, and it should be joyous. I could not even imagine, you know, no, no offense to anyone who w works in a cubicle, I couldn't imagine my life working in a cubicle. It just, I had like a visceral reaction. And believe it or not, in college, that was my job to build those cubicles. I did that all the way through college, <laughs> going into Boston. We made like mazes for people. And I know that's a lot of good things go on in there, but every time we'd finish the job, it started out as an open, a giant open room, and we'd build this maze of panel systems. They were all 62 inches high, so you could barely see them. But I would always, at the end of the job when we were leaving, I'd look up over the top and see the outline of the maze, and I would think, I will never work in a place like this. <laughs> but now look at me. What a mess. <laughs> so anyway. One big cubicle. <laughs> I know. I'm in a cubicle. With three floors. Of my own making. The walls are creeping in. Uh, anyway. Um, but it gets back to the idea that whatever you're doing, work should be joyous. It should. You know, we're people. We want to be expressive. And we have something to offer. There's a treasure inside of us that needs to come out in some form or fashion. I mean, you're, we're all at different places with this, and I love just this craft is a great medium to, to experience that. So anyway, John Ruskin is very influential on people in this time. And one of the undergrad students at the time in Oxford, his name was William Morris. And he was so taken by this whole idea by John Ruskin that he left his track 
to plan to be a minister, to instead try to influence and change society through the arts. Isn't that cool? I kind of relate to that guy because believe it or not, I was in seminary and I got my degree in a Master's of Divinity. <laughs> So I kind of have something in common with William Morris, although I didn't influence the world quite like I'm he did. I'm not laughing because I think that's silly. I'm, th I'm laughing because the divine part just cracks me up. What divine part? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> that any of us would think we can master divinity. Oh, a them. master of divinity, yeah. You're so divine. Anyway, but he left the track of being a minister to instead influence the world through... through um, the world of art, in, influence culture through art. So he starts reacting against the machine and the whole Victorian ideal and decides to make things simpler, more direct, more personal. And so this is going on in England. And let me just show you a couple pictures. Um, this is uh, this book, by the way. <laughs> I have barely tapped this book. I know I shared it one other night, but this book has amazing history of furniture making. So you can What's go it to called, the hon? Oh, Judith Miller's Furniture: World Styles from Classical to Contemporary. But anyway, um, we'll put the the link in. There. Yeah, this is the Arts and Crafts period, and as you open up to the Arts and Crafts style page, where it begins. They say, yeah, it's from 1880 to 1920. So that gives you some idea of history. Now, most of us recognize this style. This was by Gustav Stickley, who was out in New York, over kind of near the Buffalo area, um, building uh, the American version. But before he got started, the thing launched over there in England with reform and reaction, all right? So um, it says here, uh, the Industrial Revolution turned the world upside down. But while some reveled in urban prosperity, others yearned for a simple life based on traditional values. And so you have, I don't know, can you see that little picture right there? Mm -hmm. There's William Morris. And here's a chair that he designed. Um, it's still got some bells and whistles like left over from the Victorian days. But it's kind of interesting. He, was, he got all into art prints and he was into fabrics. So not just furniture, but the idea of a simpler kind of things in your home being things that were handmade, that added to your life. They weren't just coming off an assembly line and busying up your world. So... That was old, the old idea. He died in 1896, and the very same year, an architect is published in this magazine. I think it was called, it's not Home Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's something like that. It was the big home magazine at the time. This architect, Frank Lloyd Wright, gets his first publication the very same year he dies, and, and Frank Lloyd Wright goes on to be the great architect of, with the arts and crafts motif in architecture. And the following year, 1897, the Arts and Crafts Society in America is founded, and this exposition is launched right here in Boston, just south of here, in Copley Hall. I'm, I gotta look that up, that must be in Copley Plaza. I figured that out. <laughs> anyway. Convince me. Uh, so in those days, an exposition like that, that traveled and went to big cities, you know, people didn't get out as much. So when they would come to these expositions and see these amazing new kind of cutting edge ideas, they would launch and take off. And so super influential, especially can you imagine all the makers and furniture designers in America? So this spreads in America rapidly. It already there was the ideas in, in many places. But people like Stickley really take off and put their American spin on it. So that's mostly what we know of 
is the American spin, and that is represented, you know, by these. The ornamentation is really reduced to the beautiful materials, like nice materials, um, joinery. So joinery is exposed in many cases, and hardware. So simple hardware. I don't know if this is the book, but there's some chests of drawers that are awesome. Uh, this is more the European thing still here. It shows what's going on in Britain. See what I mean? It's like all over the place. But here, here's another one of William, Mor William Morris. This is that same chair, but a little more refined. No more carved bells and whistles. It's starting to get more streamlined. But I want to come back to this because it's kind of interesting to check that. And then here's more of the arts and crafts with a, a rocking chair, classic rocking chair there. All right, so. <coughs> Where did you mention the Stickley Museum was? Because they're saying here it was in Syracuse, is that what you said? Syracuse, said? yes, Syracuse, yes. thank you. Yeah, out in New York. There was other makers out, it was happening in there in mid, up, what do you call that, upstate New York? I know there's, I think I saw signs for the museum when I went out there to Rochester on my way. And, uh, Ken, but, that, that book is uh, Julie Miller's furniture book. We'll put it in the, in the description. Yeah. All right, so a couple more pictures, and then we'll get into our design. Um, so one of the things from this book, this, this has great pictures. Uh, there's, they go into the green and green house. That's out, uh, not the green and green house. It's the, the Gamble House, famous house that the Green and Green Brothers, who interpreted arts and crafts in their own little way, put a lot of texture into it and these curved surfaces and outstanding. And you can build furniture in that style as well. They, there's quite a few examples of that. But this chest of drawers is an excellent example of the kind of ornamentation you had with, with arts and crafts furniture. It was just very um, basic, linear. It was about the materials. So you had a lot of rift or quarter sawn grain wood. Very rarely would you see plain sawn. You really wouldn't. Um, Stickley used a lot of quartered. I restored things in a church once that was completely built in, I think, 1900 or 1910. The entire church, all the pews, was the most beautiful old growth rift sawn. Uh, the altar was outstanding. Anyway, it, a lot of rift sawn was used as well because they weren't trying to use the flecking. And then you have the hardware. This doesn't show any joinery coming through, but you can be sure there's nice mortise and tenons in there. And then the last thing for now I want to show you is look at this chair. This is this is uh, what happens when an architect designs furniture. <laughs> this was designed by, this is a Frank Lloyd Wright chair, which he made for a certain house, the, Will, the Willits house. Um, and around the table it looked, oh, uh, you know, it had that medieval look almost around the dining table. Very high, and these long, thin uh, strips vertically, little squares filling the space in the back. But it's like 90 degrees. So that has to be a really uncomfortable chair to sit back in. <laughs> sit up straight, Tommy. Looks good. I mean, you, of course, you'd have no choice. But, I mean, our body wants to recline. But it's, it's classic, you know, but it's an architect's version. It's meant more for the visual effect. So anyway, I'm just showing you those things because I want to use some of those um, elements in our design. So we're going to incorporate the linear nature, the nice materials. We're going to use white oak, and we'll be featuring the uh, riff sawn, quarter sawn grain as much as possible, like on the front. And we're going to use integrity, honest joinery that comes through in cases. We're going to use through mortise and tenons. So let me show you some of these elements. 
Um, this is actually a rocking chair that I built as a mock-up for a rocking chair that ended up being a little bit different. This is the actually the mock the rocking chair I built for um, an episode of Rough Cut. Yeah, no, I, I was I wasn't forgetting. I was trying to think of the year. Was it 2015? I guess it must. Have, I apologize. Well, I don't remember. I think it was 2015. And then, uh, anyway, this was the rocking chair mock-up, and I built it all out of poplar and just screwed it together. But look at what elements I included here. We just looked at that Frank Lloyd Wright chair. See those, those slats or splats or spindles? They're just square. And these are all just three-quarter inch square. Space by three-quarters of an inch. So you have this very regimented kind of linear effect. So I wanted to, instead of having the stickly look with the big wide slats, like only three or four, I thought this minimal Frank Lloyd Wright influence would be nicer for this chair. And then on the back, I, in, I repeated the theme. We've got seven on the sides. We've got seven on the back. But these seven on the back incorporate a beautiful curve with a lower lumbar support, which you wouldn't see much not certainly on Stickley, but there appears to be lumbar support on the Morris chair that, that he built way back, even predating Stickley. So I just wanted to try to make my own little spin on craftsman style with comfort. Why not, right? And then the arms have this slight curve to uh, support and to be visually appealing so that you've got the curve of the rocker and then the curve of the arm kind of counterbalances and adds a little visual interest with that curved line. And then we have the, the curved back legs sweeping back as well. So you've got this interplay of these curves and that leg. Let me sit down and I haven't sat in this chair for a while. So this is what I did. I tested it and uh, felt, hey, that was pretty good, pretty nice. But you know what it was lacking when you went like this? You had no head support. And you know, it's hard to sit in a chair for any length of time at the end of the day and not go like this. <laughs> you know what I mean? On the, on the, on the sofa. But um, I almost never do that though, right? I can't imagine. The last time I ever remember that posture from you. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's a, I don't have it over such, I, now it's the, it's the couch. So anyway, I decided to make another version of this with about five inches higher so that when you put your head back, you would hit the crest rail. And that's what this profile represents. Now this is the real deal. This is made in white oak. And look how different it is. If I put it up next to this one, I carried the same curve, but turned it back a little bit because it needed to, to support your head. And so all the back slats, or splats, in this case as a backrest, had to be extended as well. So you don't see that with this, but this is the actual profile. If you ever wanted to build this rocking chair, if you're really into arts and crafts, um, you know, you want to get started with this. We have the full-size drawings of this new version, the taller one, with the whole video series if you wanted to try that out. But what I love about this chair, too, is it features another, that, that great arts and crafts motif of the through tenon. I mean, look at that thing. It's, you do, let me see if I can get this apart. I just took it down from the attic, and it hasn't been out for a while. This is one that's kind of a sample because I got, it's all checked. It's not really, let's knock this apart. All right, check that out. I mean, that is a tenon. It's the real deal. It's going all the way through and it's slightly chamfered on the end. And you can see the one in the back. Let me knock this in. One in the back is the same, except it actually is slightly curved to follow the contour. 
and chamfered as well. So this has got a knot there. This is not a one I would sell, but anyway, there's a lot of honesty and integrity with this style of work. And boy, in the white oak, it's solid. It's not going to come apart for any time soon. So we're going to incorporate this same thing, these through tenons, in our coffee table. So let me go ahead and. Mike wants to take us back to the, you to take him back to the attic. Oh. <laughs> Nothing's happened up there, Mike. <laughs> if you want to see the attic as it is now, look at the video I made six months ago. <laughs> oh, you made a little bit ahead of me. I have made a little bit of progress, but little is the operative word. Uh, so the dream's still alive. Though. It's the library. It's the library. I don't want to. I don't want to mess it up. So. <laughs> so. Also, I built an ottoman for this chair where I incorporated this, and I really liked the look of it. Instead of using seven, I went with five on the sides. And so I'm going to incorporate that for our coffee table. So we'll be doing this kind of thing. There's nice tenons all here and here. And this is, I, it's really kind of a direct, even though it's straight line, it has a nice influence. Um, I'll show you some of the design decisions I'm working with as well. So let's look at let's look at our drawing really quickly here. This is my drawing of the ottoman. So this is the ottoman I made for that rocker that has never been published. I've never I've never done full size drawings or anything. I just had a client who who got a couple for a camp and. Excuse me. And they asked if I could make a couple ottomans. So this is sized across the same as the width of the front of the chair. And then I figured the height of um, where you would want your legs to rest. So, but look at we've got these nice through tenons from the sides. So you see them from the front. And then from the end view, we've got our five slats going vertically and then there's a mid shelf underneath that's not the full width i don't like it going the full width because it's your feet bump into it if you're sitting if you if you're sitting there and your feet aren't on there and i don't want it to go the full width for a coffee table either because for the same reason you know i don't you extend your feet and i don't want it to be hitting that edge out there so it'll be a fairly narrow or shelf but we'll see what we end up with so this ended up being 16 by 20 oh the cushion was 16 by 22 but the uh, overall dimension of the piece was 25 and a half by 17 and a half so that's some of the elements so our our coffee table will have a flavor of that but not exactly like it let me show you uh some of the sketches I've been messing around with. Check this out. <laughs> really novel, huh? <laughs> so, uh, let me see. I know there's not a lot of distinction here, but I was just scribbling. This would be just for a straight, having a larger overhang. That's too much there, but I want, I want to have a more gracious overhang than typical you would see on tables, I mean, maybe like that. And then, so this represents just a straight square leg, like the ottoman, all right? Then this next one down here, I was trying to build in a little bit of a flare. So we're having this sweeping leg, which you see some in arts and crafts style, where you have a little bit of a curvature. And, you know, I kind of like that. There's this place up in... Um, the north side of the lake. What town is it in? Called Castle in the Clouds. It's become, it's become the camera lady in Moultonboro. Is it? Is it Moultonboro? Okay. Um, the camera lady and I like to go up there and walk. And it's spectacular. There's some beautiful views of the lake region in New Hampshire. If you ever get up here, it's a, it's a gorgeous place to visit. But um, Castle in the Clouds. It was built right around 1900 by a guy who made it in the shoe 
industry. He owned a shoe f making factory when shoes were big, right? <laughs> and they were made in America. They're not big anymore. <laughs> <laughs> in America, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're kind of important, but they were big and uh, so big <laughs> that he made it big, and he made a lot of money. Anyway, he he was so uh, caught up in in designing this beautiful home, and so it's not this ostentatious type, you know, McMansion you would see today. It it's a work of art. The whole house. And when you walk up to it, it's just planted right on the top of this hill, overlooking the lakes of New, New Hampshire. It's spectacular. You can look it up online, the castle in the clouds. But it's Reek's craftsman period, the whole thing. The outside has these gorgeous timbers with timber frame, but the walls are these stones, like round stones, and they're beautifully fitted. And what really, why I'm telling you this, is what really captures me about the place is when I walk up to it, instead of those stone walls being vertical right to the ground, they come down and then they have this gentle little swale out, this little curvature at the bottom of the walls all around. So it's like sitting in there, almost like a hobbit's house, you know? But it has this beautiful feel to it, like nothing is, nothing, everything's, thought over. Everything was fussed over thought and, and really massaged like, like a craftsman thing, you know, like you can imagine all the workers there just loving it. And then you go in, the door is fantastic. There are walkways and arches, and, uh, but in the home it's beautiful, and it, but it just feels everything is authentic as it was, and it has the craftsman feeling all over it. Wonderful place to tour if you're up in the lakes region. And check out the trails. That's kind of fun too. But um, I want I love that look, that little swale look, because to me, that little subtle curvature, it adds a lot. You still have this craftsman style feeling, but the piece feels more grounded. And there's also something organic about that, that little subtlety. You know the way I like to pillow up surfaces? It's similar to that. It's that subtle little flare at the bottom leg. So I was trying to capture that and draw that here a little bit. And it would be on both sides of the leg. But so that's how approximately it would look. Um, but uh, not, the, not the best drawing. I remember I submitted a drawing once to the furniture masters. Like we had to submit our concept sketch for our piece each year. And Jerry Osgood was the, one of the jurors. And if you don't know, he, he was, or he is, he's still, he's not as active, but at the time he was one of the jurors, and he's, he was like the patriarch of the, of the group and an amazing maker, if you ever want to look up his work. But he spoke so quietly, and, and he had a wit and a cutting edge to him because he could be very blunt. But he was such a gentle, nice guy that it was funny if he would even if he would criticize you. And so I submitted my sketch <laughs> of a chair, and it was, this is reminding me of it. It was kind of scribble like that, and, he, and it would, no real definition. It was, this is more conceptual, just to get kind of the visual, visual, but I had no definition to my chair. I was just drawing kind of the curve, feeling, and outline of it. And he looks at it, and he goes, kind of, kind of looks like a grave rubbing. A grave rubbing, you know. <laughs> That's what it looked like. <laughs> I brought him in, like we do these seminars in the prison, and he came in to, to present to the inmates, like in Concord State Prison. He's, he was kind of frail, and he, and he was coming in, and, and, but a master craftsman. And he was, that night he did a presentation on making timber doors. So all these inmates are crowded around this bench, and there's frail Jerry in the middle, like, telling them how to make timber doors. And you just want to sand in the groove like this. And he was speaking so quietly, but he had like this authoritative tone to him. And I wish I had a picture of it, because all the inmates were like, leaning in, like, what's he saying? They were gripped by the guy. 
He didn't have to speak with power. He spoke quietly and softly and directly with authority. So anyway, so he made fun of my, my grave rubbing. And this is kind of the way it starts for me, is scribbles like that. And then I'll try to, you know, this is trying to get a little more three-dimensional appearance of what I'm thinking. Um, <coughs> you could also splay the legs. So if we come down the drawings here to the bottom one, I was just playing around with what would it look splayed. I don't really want to go splayed like that. I think doing something like that would be a little more subtle and with through tenons on the curve is kind of sweet. So this is the direction I'm heading. I'm not going to reveal anything because I don't have anything. <laughs> but I want you to see this is the thought process that we go through. Um, I was also thinking while I was doing this that here it is. I got the chair, the coffee table, the ottoman. They're almost all the same. And it reminded me of the, I think it was the Brady Bunch movie. Did you guys see that? <laughs> I, there was one scene. I remember nothing about that movie except for this one thing. Like in the old Brady Bunch days, they would always show uh, Mr. Brady was an architect. And he designed the Brady house. Did you know that? He did. It was a beautiful ranch. And they would always show you the ranch. And then you'd get the interior scene when I was going on the family. So anyway, in the movie, Mr. Brady has to make this big presentation to a board about this concept he has for this new office building. And they're eagerly awaiting Mr. Brady's presentation. He, and he walks in, and he's got the model. And it's just a big, giant version of his house for the office building. <laughs> but the idea is he only had one idea. He only had one design, one concept. <laughs> and it's so funny to me because that's kind of a fear that, in reality, a lot of us share. Like, do I only have one idea? If I come up with one song, is that it? Then what? What if I run dry? Yeah. What if I only have one season on PBS? <laughs> what if I'm a one-hit wonder, right? That kind of thing. But here's the thing. Everybody feels that way like, when you're doing things. But the beauty of, of furniture world is you never run out of ideas because you have people and influences to look at. I want to show you something. Look at this. This is the... The William Morris chair, right? There's, there's that leaning chair. I want to show you something. Look at This is Thomas Moser Furniture, 2013. They started out designing uh, main, mainly like Shaker-inspired furniture. Um, but he would often, I, look, look at these stools. Pretty nice, huh? Sorry, I'm getting distracted. Shiny object. Let me go to the bookmark. Um, I want you to see this chair in here. Would you look at that? That's a recliner. That's the Thomas Moser. Let's see what it is. It's the lolling chair, an ottoman. The Moser lolling chair. Okay, does it look familiar? It's actually, I, I know that they, like everyone else, when you're kind of trying to come up with a great design, they are referring to some designs that influence history. In fact, a lot of their designs, I have noticed, are kind of derived from iconic pieces in history, but, but moderned up. So it's, it's just inspired by, right? It's not really stealing. <laughs> so anyway, all that's to say is there's so many places that we can draw inspiration. And, not, and the well never really runs dry. And we have friends and, and guilds to join. It's, it's never ending. And there's inspiration in the woods and in the material we have. It just goes on and on. So anyway, I'm going to percolate on this. And we'll have a drawing for next time. Um, so the last thing that we'll cover in our course is the finishing. And we're going to make a real craftsman finish. So check this out. This is the chair that I've always shown you. This, 
this is the, the side chair that was featured in a recent issue of Fine Woodworking. And thank you, a lot of you have wanted to build this and you've, you've gotten the full size drawings. I think you'll love that. And we also made the video series for this, but this is the finished version. And this has the Craftsman inspired color on it. And I went through a series of, like just a progression of, uh, whoops, getting all messed up here. I went through a progression of finish application to get this finish. And it, so it has kind of a complexity to it because it's put on in these layers of different coloring which mimics age and the warmth of a good craftsman style finish. So there was, I think it's issue number 278 of Fine Woodworking. If you're a member there, you could check this out if you haven't already seen it. This is actually, this shows you the progression of this finish right here. See that last square, how it's almost exactly the same? It's a little darker. But we've got the natural, and then we have a stain, a sealer, a glaze, a sealer, shellac. And then you have this optional, you can do another glaze of black. Like the black is kind of optional, but it does add like this. If you look at a lot of that old arts and crafts, you'll have like this blackening around the joints and in there, and it gives you kind of this depth and appearance of age and antiquity. So we'll be going over our finish when we get to the end of our coffee table as well. Oh, and I haven't mentioned that someone's gonna win the coffee table. <laughs> I'm losing my mind. No, that's true. Someone's gonna walk away with that coffee table. And you better come and pick it up because I do not wanna ship it. I thought about not gluing it up. Someone made the great suggestion last time, I'm sorry if I forgot to get back to you, of not gluing up the stool so I could, it could be an assembly project and fun and for the person, it'd be easier to ship. But I felt like I had to glue that up. And I probably have to glue up the table too to do the finish and all that. So we're giving away the coffee table. So if you want to be part of that, you've got to register for the drawing and someone's going to win that coffee table. Now as for dimension, I'm thinking somewhere, somewhere around 20, 21 by, I'm going to make it, I think 42 would fit in front of most sofas. So that'll be a lavish little, you know, nice rectangular coffee table. So if it's 21 by 42, that'll be really nice. But then a good overhang and then the white oak, which again is going to be donated by Goose Bay Lumber. Thank you, Goose Bay. So uh, I'll be picking that up and we'll be talking about milling materials on Tuesday night. Do we have any questions? Uh, no fuming on that finish? Oh, no, I did not fume this. I, I have fumed. <laughs> I fumed, man. <laughs> Alice. <laughs> no, I have, I did not, that's fuming for you, those you don't know, is using ammonia on white oak, which has this strong fumes, as you know, and actually putting the white oak in a bubble or a tent, a plastic tent, and just opening a can of ammonia and sliding it in there of different concentration. So the store-bought ammonia is about 3% ammonia. And that's pretty strong, right? You can get industrial at um, like Ace Hardware around here, and that's 10%. And that's really feels. So you can use that. I went, and of course, I had to get the laboratory. What, what are you shaking your head for? Are you for? sure you want to say this out oh, loud? I'm, yeah, no, nobody's going to do this. <laughs> the ammonia police are going to come. No, it's not illegal. I'm kidding. I ordered it. <laughs> I ordered it online. It's, uh, it, it was a laboratory, and it's like 28%. It's scary. Do not get that, okay? <laughs> So anyway, I wanted, I experimented to see what the real They're ammonia. They're saying that explains a lot. <laughs> to see what the real ammonia color is, you know, so that 
I could mimic and duplicate it with a stain. So that's a safer method. So that's, I'm going to show you the method. You don't need to do ammonia, trust me. All the ammonia does is that it gives you the initial coloring of the wood, and you still, you can achieve that with aniline dye stains are easy to apply and get that color. So that's what we're going to do on our finish. Any other question? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> would a breadboard end on the top fit this ANC style? Hmm. Will's asking. I don't know. I, you know, now that you mention it, who asked that? Will. Will. That's a good question. I don't, and now that you mention it, I don't think I've ever seen a breadboard end in all these books. Um, I'll show, I wanted to show you, that reminded me, this one other. Look at this table. This is actually a coffee table size right here. Look at the, I don't know, can you see in the camera the, this beautiful like flecking on there? Um, but they're almost always solid right out to the end. The tops tend to be a little thicker than three quarters. They're going to be, it's going to be probably a seven eighths inch top. You know, I think an inch would be too heavy on a small coffee table like this, but it could be up to an inch. We'll see. If it looks too heavy, we'll just chamfer a little off the bottom and it'll look lighter from the. Are you going to make table. a model of this table? A, a mini model? I might make a mini model. Maybe we'll make a, that and, would be a fun model to make. Yeah. And full size drawings, people are asking, or somebody asked earlier, I think. Yes, we will have full size drawings. So I'm going to be at work at that. Actually, I'm going to create right here on this paper. I'm going to once I resolve dimensions and and the details, I'll be making a scale size drawing, from which we can derive a model, at one eighth inch scale. So every eighth of an inch equals an inch. And, uh, and then we'll make a full-size drawing of this. It's probably, uh, that will probably have to be two pages because of the size of it. So we'll make a full-size drawing, and you, you'll be able to get those. And I want to try to get those as far down the road and to, as early as possible. So hopefully yes. early next week. All so right. we'll get that up for people that want to order those. Um, what is the difference between, let me re say this correctly, Stuart's asking how much of a difference is there between arts and crafts and craftsman style furnishings? Is there? Oh, it's actually the same, Stuart. It's the interchangeable name for the same period. Okay. The arts and crafts period is substituted often for craftsman style furniture. So the craftsman style is interchangeably used. So yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. It's so good to be back with you and uh, back in the shop and enjoying a little time. I'm really excited to get into this project, and I hope you'll enjoy it too. We'll have a craftsman experience together. We'll make sure all these, all the joinery is honest and detailed with fine, you know, and there'll be nothing fake about this thing. And, but we want to make it beautiful, too. So hope you'll come along for the ride. I'm anticipating four to six sessions. So that will fit nicely right. Uh, that'll only be two weeks because we're going to mesh with our Shop Night Live. So wow. Yes, how, and uh, Antonio is asking how soon we'll have the materials list ready. Can we work on that, too? Yes, I'll have that. I will have all that for um, Tuesday night. So. That'll be good. So we'll get the we'll get the plans moving and uh, ready yes. available available sooner than the stool has been. You know that yeah, the stool was different. Frustrating a little bit. The stool was actually made differently. It was because it wasn't straight lined. We were sculpting that thing, and as you know, we didn't know until we shaped the seat how I wanted to depict it on the drawing. So that was a really live with it and work it out as we went. This I will have because it's straight lined. We'll get the drawing up much earlier. So thank you all so much for being part of this. Thanks for um, supporting us, for just being part of this family that's growing here. And remember, if you enjoy these, mash that subscribe button <laughs> and share and like and comment as you will. 
Thanks so much. I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday night as we begin the craftsman style coffee table. <laughs> I almost said chop stool. All right, we'll see you then. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.